What I'm going to say is a really condensed version of an argument. And it is also a wish for me, and it, a wish means that it is not yet realized. And therefore, it is also an invitation to you. Let me start with this, um, this quotation from Jacques Derrida from, of grammatology. The notion of technique can never simply clarify the notion of writing. I mean, this will be a really good summary to what uh, Mr. Longo has said about uh, alphabetic determinism and reductionism. But I will, I will clarify this sentence from Derrida, but let's start by pondering upon the question of synchronicity and synchronization. I borrow the term synchrony and diachrony from linguistics, for those of you who, who know this subject. Synchronicity concerns language at a certain point in time, for example, the present. Diachrony concerns the development and evolution of a language through history, so it is dynamic. Synchronicity is aligned with synchronization, and I emphasize the word synchronization, because it requires a standard to be shared by all the parts to be synchronizable. The question is, will synchronization destroy heterogeneity? That's to say difference. Or with a synchronization, it also opens the question of heterogeneity through interpretation. Therefore, there is no longer opposition between synchrony and diachrony. For example, as we know that the invention of the Greek alphabet also means the distinction of other dialects at the time, um, but this synchronization also gave rise to law, which is the foundation of the Greek polis, and the literature and the other literal forms of art, which open up the spiritual life. If we follow this logic, then it is justified to see that today, with the invention of digital writing, the synchronization became much more powerful and becomes the founding or foundation of what we call digital cultures. However, the question is, what is the limit of this synchronization and the limit of the differences produced by this synchronization? And I think this is the key to understand what is at stake in the discussion of the new alphabet. Now, however, in the above state, the arguments that I have pronounced, there are two major presuppositions. Firstly, there is a technological determinism, the same as DNA determinism, which sees culture as the product of the synchronization process mediated by technology, from literal writing to analog writing and now digital writing. And the sacrifice of diachronicity, meaning the dynamics and diversity of languages, before synchronization can therefore be justified. Secondly, there is only one lineage of technology from the pre-modern to modern and then to post-modern, which is compatible to the concept of progress and the spirit of the Enlightenment humanism. These two presuppositions work in pair and shaped our vision of technological develop development today. Now, if we take up the arguments of the dialectics of Enlightenment uh, that Professor Kramer has just said, that's to say a dialectical movement from a two-dimensional transparency to a three-dimensional opacity. The promise of the Enlightenment is subverted in this technological lineage. Therefore, we need to raise the question of synchronization anew in our discussion of the new alphabets today. But I think it may worth add to Professor Kramer's observation that of Henry Kissinger's. In a recent article called How the Enlightenment Ends, Kissinger, Kissinger the, the former um, uh, foreign minister of the United States, claims that the Enlightenment, the age of reason, ends because machines are having probably better capacity of analyzing and reasoning. This end of the Enlightenment is that its philosophy is no longer able to cope with technology, which was its support. 
and means of universalization. I quote Kissinger, the Enlightenment started with essentially philosophical insight, spreaded by new, a new technology, and what is this new technology? Our period is moving in the opposite direction. It has generated a potentially dominating technology in search of a guiding philosophy. We see that the different points of view uh, from uh, Professor Kremer as well as uh, from Kissinger announce the same result and the necessity of a new thinking which begins after the end of the Enlightenment humanism. The contemporary technology that Kissinger is referring to, digital technology, is the alphabet of artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer network, which are contributing to a synchronization process far beyond the imagination of the Enlightenment, navigation, cartography, and military technologies. The process of synchronization is now leading towards gigantic technological systems which are moving on their own path with their own dynamics towards what we call a technological singularity. And you know that all the transhumanists are talking about the arrival, the coming of singularity. It is this gigantic technological force that witness, witnesses the end of enlightenment, while paradoxically stands for its continuation but I cannot explain this statement here. What will this new thinking be after the end of the Enlightenment? I don't pretend to give an answer to this question, but I will try to respond to it by proposing what I formulated since several years as multiple cosmotechnics, or to be uh, more simplified, a proposal for techno-diversities. And I think that in order to move away from the impasse that we are facing, because you can see that we are all moving to an apocalyptic moment, which we call the technological singularity. And I think that in order to move away from this impasse that we are facing, it's necessary to conceive the re uh, reopening of future by rethinking the concept of technology, the relation between human technology and nature. How can we think of different technological uh, futures? How is this opening of the question of technology and therefore future be possible at all? In order to conceive such a bifurcation of future, or if you prefer diversification of future, it is necessary also to conceive a multiplicity of technologies. How to raise the question of technodiversity when intellectuals today are all craving for a general artificial intelligence? We must step back to history in order to orient where we are standing, but also with a distance from it. The title of this, school, of this program, New Alphabet, invites us to think about this historical moment in view of the Anthropocene and the techno-utopia and techno-dystopia. They are the same, associated with it. But let's just stick here to the question of writing as an example to demonstrate what I mean by cosmotechnics and techno-diversities. So here I will go into the question of Chinese writing that uh, uh, Mr. Longo raised, but he didn't go into. The difference between uh, Chinese, uh, from Western phonogram and the Chinese pictogram has been stated for centuries, and I want to say that I don't use the word ideogram because it's too much a platonic notion. I use the word pictogram. And according to Jacques Derrida, the, the, the European conception of Chinese writing could be divided into two attitudes, which is either hyperbolic admiration, for example, Leibniz, or ethnocentric scorn, for example, Hegel. And we know that Leibniz admires the Chinese writing not only because the I Ching hexagram resembles the binary system that he has developed earlier, in, uh, around 16, uh, 1666, but also because it seems to him a rather developed system based on visual symbols. And it remains an inspiration for Leibniz to develop a system of writing which bypasses the phonet phonetic differences. So with the same visual, uh, same system of visual symbols, even though different people pronounce differently, but they remain universal. 
He, as he says, those who know the Chinese character are right to believe that it will become a universal character whose written form would be understood by all the world. If all people in the world would, could agree on the destination of a thing by a character, one people could pronounce it differently from the other, and we could introduce a universal symbolism. And so the, the visual probability of Chinese writing is the key to universalism. Hegel reproached the high, uh, Leibniz by saying that the written language based on signs is imperfect, if not idiotic. Instead, Hegel claims that only to the exegeticism of Chinese spiritual culture is analytic notation of representations which seduced Leibniz to the point of wrongly preferring this script to the alphabetics rather contradicts the fundamental exigency of language in general, namely the noun. What is the noun? How to understand this comment from Hegel? Derrida explains that by now it means substantiality, substance, that the other name of presence or of usia, essence. In our grammatology, Derrida provides a synthesis where I will use it as a shortcut to understand these two writings philosophically. Phonetic writing is a signifier of substance and Chinese writing is related to relation. So one substance, the other relation. Therefore, Derrida claims that when commenting on Hegel's proposal for the Aufheben of other writings, particularly of hieroglyphic scripts and the Leibniz and characteristics, that, I quote, non-phonetic writing breaks the noun apart. So the Chinese writing for him seems to a, a, a kind of to, to, to break apart the uh, Western philosophical thinking or, or, or logocentrism. Now, Derrida continues, I quote, it, it means Chinese uh, writing, describes re relations and no appellations. In this regard, Leibniz is as disturbing as the Chinese in Europe. Leibniz is no longer there, we are known, but the Chinese may become even more disturbing. But this is another question. Derrida hinted on the tension between the substantial thinking and the thinking based on relations, but he didn't enter into the question of relation here because it is a thinking which is very different from the Western tradition. And that is also why Heidegger renounced to develop a theory of relation in paragraph 18 of Zion Zeit. Sure, for sure, it is not that there is no relation in alphabetic writing. The composition of a word could be analyzed according to relations, for example, vowels and consonant, prefix and postfix, subject and predicate in the sentence. But that is also why later in the early 20th century, when Bertrand Russell in principle of mathematics as a report Aristotelian logic, which is based on subject and predicates, or substance and accidents, uh, to a logic of relation and relator. But we maybe we'll go into this in this discussion. So what is the question of relation that Derrida hinted why it didn't enter here? Leibniz has made a hypothesis that Chinese writing started with a hexagram and evolved into pictogram. This may be historically doubtful, but he is also not without reason that both writings of hexagram and pictogram come from the observation of phenomena and patterns of the cosmos. In a famous commentary of I Jin, uh, which is a, 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 there are ten commentaries of I Jin, which we write, we can read about the invention of the hexagrams. Instantly, when Bao Si, which is the, the person who invented the, the Hasegram, and the Yi Qin had kept, come to the rules of all under heaven, looking up, he contemplated the brilliant forms exhibited in the sky, and looking down, he surveyed the patterns shown on the earth. He contemplated the ornamental appearances of birds and beasts and the different sub, uh, suitabilities of the soil. 
near at hand in his own person, he found things for consideration and the same at a distance in things in general. On this, he divided the eight chigrams to show fully the attributes of the spirit-like and the intelligent operations working secretly and to classify the quantities of the mirrors of things. So Chinese writing is a visual abstraction of the movements of or change of phenomenon, and phenomenon is called xiang. Xiang, it means phenomenon, but also image, which is a translation insisted by François Julien, but it also means an elephant. So Chinese writing is a philosophy of things, and I will try to explain uh, this later. Chinese writing is a, a philosophy of things, as the famous Bishop of Chester, John Wilkins, says in the 17th century. The basic construction of Chinese writing is pictograms, but not all Chinese characters are all drawings or patterns and phenomena, because there are other techniques being used to construct characters. However, pictogram remains the basic, and it is also famously claimed by the Tang historian San Yuanyuan, that painting and writing in China have the same origin. Now I was trying to show you this, this writing of Xiang, and you see that uh, that is an elephant. I mean, everyone recognizes that on the right. But on the left, you know, you, at the, on, the, on, the, on the characters, right, on the uh, uh, right bottom corner, you can see that the, the ancient writing is actually like an elephant. And it evolves, and it, uh, you, you, you can see that it becomes more and more abstract, but at the same time, it keeps the form of an elephant. <laughs> now, again, concerning the question of pattern, the critique of substantialism was also joined by the cybernetics and Gregory Bayson in steps to an ecology of mind when Bayson commenting on Alfred Kosibersky's famous dictum, the map is not a territory, he criticized that Western thinking is as essentially a thinking of substance, but it ignores the question of patterns and relations. Where he, we can read what he said, his, his statement, he means the Kosibsky's statement, came out of a very wide, wide range of philosophical thinking going back to Greece and the rigoring through the history of European thought over the last 2,000 cent years. In this history, there has been a sort of, a, of a rough dichotomy and often deep controversy. There has been a violent enmity and bloodshed. In all starts, it's supposed that with the Pythagoreans versus their predecessors and the argument took the shape of, do you ask what it is made of, earth, fire, water, etc., or do you ask what is, is a pattern? Pythagoras stood for inquiry into pattern rather than inquiry into substance. So this is a thinking that Gregory Bayson, the cybernetics and psychologist, believed that he has rediscovered in the early 20th century. Now, in contrast to the anti-substantialist thinking that Derrida, among others, proposed, a philosophy of relation is what I sell, what I attempt to contrast since my first book on the existence of digital objects, which is a study on the relation of thinking in and beyond the digital writing. Writing is not simply an abstraction of meaning which embeds logical relations which are called discursive relations, namely that which could be articulated by language. So it's a linguistic function, as Mr. Longo has said. But also it embeds what are called existential relations, or uh, here, for example, the relation between human and its external world. We will see that the unified meaning of a Chinese character could be decomposed into parts with different meanings which are relations and significations being observed in the world and the cosmos. So for example, I want to show you this, character fa, which means uh, law or legal, and there is the ev evolution of the writing of this. At the, at the very beginning, it's uh, like an animal uh, flowing in the water. Now that is law, uh, animal flowing in the water, where you can imagine that it is the way of driving the animals. You know? And when it comes to the recent uh, writing, we see that 
on the left hand side it's water, on the right hand side it means go. So it's to go like water is law. And if you can follow me so far, we come to understand what Derrida says, that, we, that what we quote at the beginning of this talk. The notion of technique can never simply clarify the notion of writing. Though in a sense probably different from what Derrida himself means, we see that in Chinese writing as a practice of chasers, it embeds already rich relations and patterns that could not be identified in phonetic writing. This relational way of composition embeds an original way of describing the human and its cosmos. To write is not simply to deliver communicative meaning, but also to ponder upon the relation between human and the world and the cosmos. Of course, these uncanny relations hide themselves when one develops the habitude of writing, so that the mind alone becomes the subject of enunciation and exteriorization. However, it is also by mastering writing as an art instead of means of communication that one understands the relation between writing and the Tao. The 16th century literary scholar Liu Xie says in his classic, The Literary Mind and the Carving of Dragons, that I quote, the Tao, which means, literally means the way, inspires writing and the writing illuminates the Tao, end of quote. In the ancient time, if we say that someone can write, it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't mean the same as today, for example, writing or typing an article. But rather, it also means that one who can master calligraphy properly. To become a writer is to become a calligrapher, to master the art of writing, to give spirit to the pictogram, to search for the Tao through writing. So this is an example of... Um, of calligraphy by a monk who, be, who claims that his writing is inspired by the movement of the, cloud, of, the, of the clouds on the sky. Of course, we are no longer in the ancient time, and the modernization has rendered most of these traditions obsolete. The spirit sharing the name Tao was overwhelmed by modern astrophysics and fed in face of Elon Musk's Tesla. With digital writings, everything could be reduced to 26 alphabet. However, there are different ways of reduction, as there are different input methods. Without going too much back into the history of Chinese typewriter and without listing all the input methods, I want to show you two of them. The first one is based on the composition of pictogram. So we can see here the, on the top, it's based on the composition of a pictogram, it's called the called Chi, uh, invented in the 1980s. So you have to um, think of a way to recompose the character. You have to find the rules to recompose the character in, 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 uh, from, from different radicals. Now the second, uh, second way of uh, inputting is, um, is um, based on romanization, which is called opinion today. So for example, I, we type the pronunciation of this character, but because a Chinese, uh, the same sound, as all of you know, has a, a corresponds to many characters, so you have to choose from a, a long list. Hmm? The, Roman, the romanization of Chinese writing was a project already proposed at the beginning of the 20th century, which even proposed to abandon completely the, hero, the, the hieroglyphic writing. Fortunately, it was not yet abandoned, but writing is almost all done with pinyin, especially for, those, uh, for the younger generation who type with uh, smartphones, meaning 26 alphabet. So what is the point of coming back to the question of Chinese writing and its difference from phonetic writing if all of them could be typed with 26 alphabet today? The point is not to return to ancient way of writing, but rather to step back and ask if there are different histories of technologies, different uh, trajectories of technology, and if so, what are their significance, and what are the relations between these technologies 
that is to say, the relation between the human and the world and the cosmos, or simply to say, forms of life. With writing as an example, we're trying to show that it is not possible to identify and compare phonetic writing and non-phonetic writing in a narrow sense, namely the exteriorization of sound and the practice of traces. Also, not to, to understand in the trajectory or lineage, like from the uh, ideogram and then to the logogram and then to the alphabet that uh, Mr. Rongo showed in the first slide. Writing is here also a metaphor. It is not reducible to a technique, but rather it is that which situates techniques, technology within a cosmic reality, like what a ground does to a figure in the Gestalt psychology. And this, of course, refers to the, to the question of the, total, the wholeness that uh, was hinted by Mr. Lungo. The ground in, in Gestalt psychology stabilizes the form, while the form also transforms the ground. However, when it produces a subversion of form and ground, that means the form bec becomes the ground of the ground, and that's, everything is reverted, then we arrive at what Gilles Deleuze calls a transcendental stu stupidity, and that is the danger that we are facing today. Now to conclude, I want to ask, will it be possible to find a strategy to liberate us from this apocalyptic end and to reopen the question of the future? We are far away from answering this question, not only because I was, I'm only given 20 minutes, but also because this revaluation, this unvertun in the sense of nature, of the concept of technology, that is to say, to deviate from a conventional understanding of, technology, of, of, the, of a lineage from Greek techne to modern technology is itself a shock, a shock as a suspension that may allow us to look at modern technology from a new and to negotiate a new relation with it, but not to abandon it. I mean, it's impossible if not... Uh, by negotiating an, a new relations, I don't mean simply uh, to repurpose it, but also to design tools and embed different set of relations and epistemologies from the dominant ones. A stepping back to histories of culture is not to constrain technology with culture and techniques. Uh, and to produce a dichotomy between them, but rather to reconcile culture and techniques. And the ultimate question for me in this context of the new alphabet uh, is, it, is will it be possible to conceive a techno diversity by reappropriating the new alphabet? Re reappropriating in the sense that not to be simply determined by it, but transforming it in order to give it new directions. We may want to call this reappropriation a arrogance in the sense of Heidegger. It is a transformative act which reframes the, the, the enframing, the gestern of modern technology. And it is in these attempts of reframing that we respond to the aporia of synchronicity that we raised at the beginning in order to conceive a true futurism, which is not only about acceleration, but rather techno diversities. I, I have a longer version, and which will come out, I think, at maybe later today or next week. And if you are interested, uh, you can refer to this article. I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.